so the, the, the cascade hop that sort of never caught on and, and that uh, for us was a, a, a positive thing because we could be pretty much exclusive in really featuring this uh, you know, completely different aroma profile. We started to use what became the Centennial Hop and that became a, a staple of Celebration Ale as well. We have a very narrow window of maturity. Uh, we select those hops uh, in the field where they're still maturing to get them harvested right when they're at the peak maturity. So some will be a little bit under mature and some will be a little bit over mature and, and the aromas be changed uh, as the maturity of the hop changes. We've done a lot of studies uh, taking the same field, picking uh, some uh, one week or one day, waiting three or four days, picking some more. We actually pick, so they go right from the field into a truck, a refrigerated truck, drives down to the brewery and we this is part two of my three amazing experiences with Ken Grossman, the founder of Sierra Nevada. Thank you so much for watching. Your views and support make these conversations entirely possible. Now, hitting that subscribe button is also transformative to the channel, but oddly, 73% of you have not done so yet. So if you like what you see, please click on those like and subscribe buttons to fuel our channel's clout to attract even more awesome guests. Thank you and cheers. You know, I think I mentioned that I started out as a home brewer and I ended up owning a homebrew supply store. I, I started that in 1976 and I started making my trips up to Yakima um, that year. So I went up uh, in an old uh, Toyota station wagon I had and um, picked up 100 one pound sample lots of pots. And so back in, in that era, that's done a little differently today, but back in that era, um, brewers would get what was called a brewer's cut of a bale. Yeah. And so there'd be about a one pound block cut out of the side of a 200 pound bale. Hops are typically baled in 200 pound increments. And the brewer's cut would then be shipped off to the brewery, which right. would then rub, inspect, uh, look at the hop, and judge uh, that lot of hops. And normally a brewer's cut was taken every 50 or every 100 bales. Uh, so one look at that uh, lot. But typically the lots are processed uh, in those kind of increments. So um, a, a, a kiln may hold uh, 10,000 pounds of, of hops, and they, they all get homogenized and packed into one lot. And so you get a brewer's cut, it's a sampling of that lot. Um, being a homebrew shop owner, um, I couldn't buy bales of hops. So I convinced one of the uh, hop merchants to sell me a hundred of these one pound blocks. And I wanted every variety that they had. And back in 19... You didn't care. Well, no, I did care, but but I, I wanted, you know, a, a broad of a sampling of what I was okay. being grown up in the Atma Valley. Yeah. But back in 1976, 77, uh, really one variety predominated, which was the cluster. And cluster was the mainstay of the US, US hop industry. And I think back then it amounted to uh, close to 80% all hops being grown with this one variety. And it was grown because it was a, a, a durable hop. It uh, survived what's called common storage, which we don't have really anymore, but unrefrigerated storage, it wouldn't degrade too rapidly. Okay. Uh, hops have, you know, two main attributes. They're alpha acid, so they're bittering component, and then they have their aromatic oils, which are comprised of a whole bunch of different compounds. And as the hop would age, both of those would deteriorate, and the, the cluster tended to be a little bit uh, hardier in unrefrigerated uh, storage. And at the time, clusters were really only intended to end up as an, a bittering hop uh, to go into the boil. It was not considered a, an aroma hop at all. It sort of had a catty aroma, people would say. Uh, it had a distinctive non-European aroma. And uh, you know, if you go back to that era of brewing, uh, again, commercial brewing, um, most of the brewmasters were trained in, in Europe or in Germany. And so they had all these Germanic ideas of what hops should be, what their aroma uh, fraction should be like. And you know, the Holler Tower, the Saws, or Tetnang, or those kinds of varieties had these very uh, much milder and um, uh, I guess maybe a little more uh, fruity and, and oral, floral. Yeah, yeah. They, they weren't uh, 
heavy in, in you know, sort of the pungent aromas that IPA drinkers and brewers uh, uh, feature today. Uh, so most of the Germanic brewers at big breweries didn't want to use any American hops for aroma. And so all the aroma hops were being brought in from Europe and the bittering hops were coming out of the U.S. And the U.S. was a net exporter also of, of alpha acid and of, of cluster hops. Um, soon they're... they're that, al that almost puts them in like a, a utilitarian. Yeah, they were. Right. And, and they were, uh, you know, 6 to 8% alpha pot. Yeah. Um, so moderate, uh, by today's standards, low, but moderate for, uh, for a bittering hop back then. And were they actually cheaper? Than the uh, European hops, they were typically cheaper than European hops. Although the Europeans have also a history of growing alpha hops as well, uh, so they had bittering hops about that era uh, uh, as well. Magnum and Hercules and some of the the newer bittering hops. But so there there were high alpha hops being grown in in Germany and starting to be grown in the U.S. So we had Bouillon and Brewers Gold and Northern Brewer as the sort of the up and coming maybe higher bitterness hops and they were actually featured by some u.s breweries as aroma hops um uh, bouillon uh particularly was one that was used by uh some small eastern lilies uh, uh as an aroma hop but typically typically uh, the aroma hops came out of europe back in that era um so when i went up there i bought all the hops we could get which again was clustered um, Cascade, which I'll talk about further, was a new aroma hop that was uh, being introduced into the U.S. market. Um, and then Bullion Brewers Gold, Northern Brewer, and some of those hops had European parentage and had been brought over here. Uh, one of the major brewers was trying to develop a American version of an aroma hop, uh, and that ended up uh, being the Lamet eventually, but uh, they did bring over some uh, European aroma hops and tried to grow them here with not great success. And so the Willamette was bred uh, with some European aroma hop uh, paradigm. And that was supported by one of the major brewers in the U.S. for a number of years as, as a fill-in hop. They didn't use it exclusively by any means, but they would supplement their European hops with uh, some Willamettes. Uh, Willamettes were much lower in alpha acid even than, than Cluster. Um, but I uh, said so they, they had a different purpose. So I got these six or seven varieties. That was all that was being grown. Um, and Cascade was one as a home brewer I started to play around with because it was America's first uh, developed aroma hop. And uh, it, it hadn't really found great favor. And as I mentioned, you know, most of the Germanic brewmasters uh, didn't like the, the piney uh, floral Cascade aroma. And so it languished. It never really went anywhere. It never got embraced by, by any of the major brewers. Uh, at least initially. Uh, later on, I think Henry Weinhardt's picked it up and uh, Coors used it for a while and uh, Anheuser-Busch used it. But uh, in those early years, it was considered this too odd of a hop. It didn't really fit the profile they were looking for in their lager beers. Um, so when I started uh, brewing commercially, we wanted to feature a unique American hop and that was Cascade. And at the time that was really the only option. Um, there were other ones that were being developed. So, but you were very intentional yes. to get an American hop. Right. We we I like that. We yeah. were producing a IPA. We knew from the beginning yeah. we were going to do pale ales and IPA styles. Uh, but we didn't want to lean to the the English, which, you know, in, in Europe, um, in, um, uh, ales were really uh, predominantly uh, brewed in the UK. You know, Belgium had some top fermented beers too, but... Uh, you know, most of the German beers were bottom fermented. There were a few variants that were top fermented as well. Um, but we wanted to do an ale, top fermented beer, and we wanted it to be distinctly different than what you might get in England with a top fermented beer. So we didn't want to use Fuggles or Goldings or any of those varieties that uh, were if being... You weren't into cloning. Uh, you, they, didn't, you, they didn't do cloning back in those days. Of, well, but I mean, you really, it doesn't sound like you emulated any no. beer styles. No. You... You created styles. Uh, I was a home brewer. My partner was one of my homebrew shop customers. Um, and we had the good fortune of being right down the road from UC Davis. Uh, Davis was about 80 miles from Chico. And I, I had taken a homebrew uh, home brewing class uh, at Davis, uh, extension class, uh, a, a few years before. And knew they had uh, a brewing library and they had a professor, uh, Michael Lewis, uh, who started that program up in the U.S. Um, and he had some grad students. And so we would go down there and 
uh, talk beer and brewing with uh, Michael Lewis and his grad students. And we ended up uh, spending a lot of time in the UC Davis library. Uh, they had a, a, a very extensive library, uh, lots of magazines and periodicals on brewing uh, dating back into the 50s and 60s that were really not available anywhere else. So we were able to photocopy um, hundreds and hundreds of pages of all these brewing journals from the 50s and 60s that were probably more aligned with the technology that we were able to to have in our in our little brewery. So, uh, you know, the most modern technology we couldn't deal with, but we could do something that a brewer might have done in the 50s or 60s from a technology. You, you could weld it up. Yes. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, so the the, the Cascade hop that sort of never caught on. And, and that uh, for us was a, a, a positive thing because we could be pretty much exclusive in really featuring this uh, completely different aroma profile. But you really were a rebel. I mean, yes. you, you actually, what what the others were not liking, you really glummed onto and, and tried to make, oh, it did say, you didn't try. You successfully made an American style beer. Yeah. Wow. Um, uh, again, we, we realized in, in talking to the Davis Brewers, uh, they they were the grad, graduate students who uh, I've stayed in touch with uh, some of them today. Um, but they were like, you know, you guys don't have the technology to make a, a light lager beer, which we didn't want to do anyway. Uh, it, you know, you're going to have to bottle condition because you don't have tanks you can uh, pressurize and, and don't have the filling equipment to actually fill carbonated beer and all these other things. So uh, we were thoughtful and that if we're going to do a top fermented beer, we probably need to, to lean more heavily on an aroma pro profile from the hops rather than from the yeast. Yeah. Uh, because the the uh, ale yeast tend to be a little bit coarser and, and not quite as refined as maybe a lager uh, aroma might be. And so we thought, well, we need to use a hop that's got a lot of punch. And so the Cascade was the obvious choice. And then as new hops were being developed, uh, most of them also were not favored by the big brewers because they you know, had weird, weird aromas or strong aromas. And when the Centennial hop came out and they were non-traditional. Yeah. Uh, non-traditional for a Germanic brewer. Right. Uh, right. So when the Centennial hop was in development and, and it was named Centennial a number of years after we started using it, two hops in, in research and development that we liked. Yeah. And uh, so we started to use what became the Centennial hop. Um, and that became a, a staple of Celebration Ale as well. Wow. But wait, I, I had no idea how central hops were to Sierra Nevada. Yeah. So as we were in the hop room, these are brand new hops. Yeah. These, so, these are months old. Right? So, so we're in our day room today. Um, yeah. And I don't know what, what vintage this is, but, but uh, hops are harvested. Uh, so hops are, they grow on vines. They don't grow on vines. So it's a, 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 a vine and uh, it's got little prickly hairs on, on it. And the hop plants trellis up, uh, you know, over 20 feet. Um, and they have a fairly rapid growth and maturation once they come out of their dormancy. Um, but they have a very narrow window of maturity. And it's actually caused some issues with uh, the focus on certain varieties, yeah. because if you have too much of one variety and it's only ripe and it's perfect ripeness for three or four days, and you've got thousands and thousands of acres that you have to pick, you either have to start picking them early or picking them late because you can't pick them all in that exact perfect window. And so for Cascade um, and Centennial for Celebration Ale particularly, uh, we select those hops uh, in the field where they're still maturing and then we uh, help steer that harvest window with the growers uh, in order to get them harvested right when they're at the peak maturity. And uh, it's just a, a matter of, of, of math that uh, you can't harvest all the hops in that exact window. Um, it has to spread out over um, a, a week or 10 days in many cases. So some will be a little bit under mature and some will be a little bit over mature and, and the aromas do change uh, as the maturity of the hop changes. Um, you know, what you're looking for in, in the hop is really at the base of the bract. And the, the, the resin, the, the yellow powder in there. I didn't pick the perfect cop to look at. But, <laughs> that's all right. But that's where the, the goodness of the hop uh, lies as far as brewing value. 
other parts of the hop um, are beneficial for brewing. So it's got tannins and, and uh, polyphenols and other things that uh, are positive in beer. And that's why you really don't want to brew beer with 100% hop extracts. You really need to put in some real hops, whether they're oak cone or pellets or powder, because uh, you want some of those other constituents of the hop. But the, the real brewing value, uh, the aromatic uh, oils and the bitter resins are at the base of that of that brack. And so that maturity window, you, you can walk a field and you can start opening up the hop and looking at the color of the uh, lupulin uh, and rubbing it, breaking the, rupturing the cells and smelling it. And so you get a pretty good idea uh, after a number of years of doing that, of sort of where the variety is best in that pick window. Uh, and then this is also very personal among brewers. Some brewers like early pick, some brewers want mid pick, and some brewers want late pick. And we've done a lot of studies uh, taking the same field, picking uh, some uh, one week or one day, waiting three or four days, picking some more on the same field, waiting a few more days, picking some more, and keep all those hops separate. We brewed with them. So uh, early, middle, late, pick the same variety could be dramatically different. Um, you know, some develop uh, aromas that some brewers don't like. Um, some want a more, more subtle character. Some want really sort of the, the, the in-your-face wallop of a, uh, of a really yeah. intense hop aroma. Yeah. So in those cases, you generally want to pick later, but sometimes you go too late, then you start getting uh, some real sort of off aromas as well. So it's a, a real science of, of trying to pick that window that meets your uh, desires as a brewer. And uh, I know uh, great brewers who have different opinions on certain variety of pick windows, um, but that's uh, you know what makes all of our beers you know unique and, and different from each other. So you're kind of brewing with flowers, for, for lack of a different way to look at it. And the fresher the flower, and the less processed the flower, the better the flavor it imparts. Um, yeah, I guess so you can. If some some of that is is completely true, but uh, others of it there, there's variation. So. I guess you could uh, compare it to um, making um, pesto with fresh basil uh, um, versus using a dried form or even, yep. you know, seasoning in the kitchen. Um, you know, that fresh herb has different characteristics than a dried herb does. And hops are an herb, essentially. So, um, you know, how they're handled and processed ha does have a lot to do with how the ultimate flavor is. Uh, so we're in our day room right now. So this is where... Uh, we break the bales down for putting in the brew kettle and in the torpedoes. These some tor so we pack these full with fresh cone hops. Inside here is a big stainless steel mesh basket that's packed full of hops. Uh, they are able to hold uh, over 50 PSI. They're a high pressure vessel. It allows us to push the beer through it and do a circulation loop for days uh, in some cases. And that extracts those oils from the hops. Not a lot of bitterness comes out, but uh, the aromatic oils get absorbed into the alcohol and the beer from it. But these big containers behind us will literally be dumped into these. These are going into the brew kettles. So these okay. containers here are, are for our daily um, uh, daily doses that go into the kettle. Well, how do they get in there? Um, somebody will get up on a, a ladder and, yeah. and pack them in there. Pack them in there. Yeah, we have an, another room over here where they're But packed. the principle's the same. The principle's the same. So this, but this is... Is this kind of central to the Sierra Nevada flavor? I mean, Sierra, Sierra Nevada has a kind of common element of deliciousness, which I think a lot of us that enjoy Sierra Nevada kind of gravitate to. And is the, the hops really where it starts in your mind? Hops are certainly a big part of it. Our, our yeast culture, same yeast culture we've used from day one, it imparts its own character as well. So the combination of our yeast, our fermentation process, and our hopping uh, make the signature Sierra Nevada. So I'll, I'll show you this. So this is uh, out of a bale. And so when hops are harvested, you know, they're a big flower cone. And again, uh, some of the, the cones can be two or three inches long. Um, these are minimally processed. So what they do after they uh, are picked off the vine, they go to a kilning process. And we've done a lot of work with uh, some other brewers and the growers up in Yakima. Uh, to try to refine the killing process a little bit. Um, you need to dry the hops down to below 10% moisture uh, so they're stable. Uh, again, I use basil as an example. If you just put basil in a bag in your refrigerator, 
it's going to turn slimy and, and break down within a matter of, of you know days or weeks. Uh, hops would do the same thing. So they, they're not stable when they're wet. Um, we brew a wet hop beer, uh, but that's done essentially right after picking, uh, rush to the brew kettles and we throw them in. Uh, so they need to be dried to be stabilized. Um, and they're killed in a, uh, a small uh, level um, uh, floor kiln that blows warm air up through the bed of hops uh, and drops the moisture, uh, hopefully evenly, uh, not too dry, not too wet, just right around that 10% moisture level. And then they're cooled um, and then pressed into 200 pound bales. And so this is, when we get them, we get a, a bale like this, where this is the chunk of a bale. Um, but you can still break apart the bale. So I will hand this to you here. Yeah. And um, then I'll, yeah. If it's, so what I'm doing now, there's two bowl. I'm warming the hop. Um, so I'm heating it up by rubbing it with the friction. But I'm also breaking those glands in order to release a lot of the aromatic oils. And so, uh, smell. Uh, um, so I, I ruptured the glands. I rubbed them between my hands to, to heat them up and release that aroma. And it's just a wonderful uh, aroma of, of fresh hops. Uh, no, nothing like it. And so when we go up to, to Yakima, uh, one of the things we do with every lot of hops is this kind of a rub. And uh, we'll take the hops, it'll be a group of us. Um, normally my, my brewers will come up um, and we'll all individually smell um, lots and lots of, of cuts of the, the hop varieties. And so we'll, we'll, look, we'll smell Cascade, for example. And since we buy over a half a million pounds of Cascades, we look at a lot of samples of, of Cascades. We'll rub each representative sample from each group of, of hops, each lot of hops, uh, and then we'll rank them. And then we'll pick the ones that have problems. And, and hops can have problems, uh, you know, with disease, bugs, uh, wind, weather, hail, um, and the sp you know, and spray burns, the uh, you know, wind burns, uh, the, all sorts of things. So, you, what, what kind of burns? I heard the wind burns. What was the other spray? So there, are, there are some um, treatments that are sprayed on hops. Okay, uh, uh, fu fungicides or bugs or right, um, and so that can burn the hop as well. Okay, uh, and so you can visually look at at the cone. So we'll pull pull a sample apart. We'll look at each cone. You'll look for stems and seeds and sticks and stones and burritos and other things that may end up in a bale of hops. We have found a burrito in a bale of hops. Oh, I thought you were making up something. No. <laughs> um, yeah, people actually warm their hops, uh, warm their burritos up in, in the, oh. in, in the uh, compost piles okay. at the hop farm. So once the hop leaves are picked off the vines, um, they're all taken uh, to a compost uh, yeah. area and they pile up these big mounds of of the leaves and those start to heat up. So I have seen uh, some of the workers will stick a burrito up there and somehow we ended up with one in a, in a bale. But anyway, that's rare. Um, and, and being able to, to, you know, as whole hop uh, users, we go through these bales uh, by hand and yep. the guys break them up and make sure there's no sticks or stems in there. So as we look at these, these are cascades. And so the timing sounds intense. Yeah, so it's about roughly a six-week window um, when all the hops are harvested. And so what an ideal yard would look like for a grower, and a, a, a yard may be 20 or 50 or 100 acres, but uh, uh, let's, let's say a 600-acre farm, which is a, a reasonable-sized hop farm that can uh, economically survive um, in, in most, most times. Um, they ideally would want varieties that ripen um, the last week in August, a different variety or first week in September, a different variety the second week in September, a different variety the third week. And, and that allows them to use their picking and killing equipment uh, for that whole six week period and get hops that are maturing uh, at different dates. So that's the ideal scenario. And I mentioned earlier, you know, un unfortunately when you get a, a hop that's super popular like Citra or Cascade was, um, those have just a window. And so when that variety gets too large, either they have to put in more uh, picking and killing equipment, which is incredibly expensive. I mean, millions and millions of dollars to put in a uh, picking setup and a kiln uh, and baling. You need to have all that stuff in order to handle the peak harvest uh, amount you have. 
And so the hop farmer is looking for early varieties, middle variety, late varieties. Um, and that allows them to uh, sequentially go through their fields when they're mature. So yeah, the, the, the hop growing is a real art um, and it requires, uh, again, the cooperation with the brewers because if, if uh, like in the olden days when cluster was the only variety, yeah, they're all ripe at the same time. You can't pick the whole year's crop in uh, you know, six weeks and have all the hops at the proper maturity level. Wow. I'm shocked at the intent, the timing. I guess I knew it was tight, but I yeah, had no idea. Probably six weeks. Yeah. Wow. I mean, there's some harvests that go a little early and some that go a little late, but uh, it's a pretty narrow uh, harvest window. And uh, all the hops for the brewer for the year are harvested in that window. And so when we go buy our hops, we've got to project what we need for the next year because we're, we're buying and we normally go to Yakima and say starting or go to the hop field starting in uh, August and start looking at them. And then we'll make maybe three to four trips. We buy hops from Oregon, Washington, Idaho in the U.S. Uh, Idaho is becoming a, a pretty big uh, acreage area for, for hop growing in America. Uh, it just passed Oregon. So uh, Washington, the Yakima Valley is number one. Idaho just passed it and Oregon is uh, number three now. So celebration is all about the hops in this room. Yep. And the timing is pretty intense. So what is it about celebration and these new hops that have to kind of all come together in that narrow window you're talking about? Yeah, so as a, again, as a whole cone beer, um, the sooner you get it after bailing um, within reason, uh, you want to actually maybe let it sit for a couple of days, um, but then it, it really has all that punch um, and you want to again, get, get a, a field that's got really nice high oil levels and so that's one of the things we look at as well when we're selecting a uh, hop for celebration is we really want uh, in the two two percent oil for Cascade is is good and you want in that two or higher level ideally um, and so we we select based on how it smells how it looks and the overall oil contribution we'll have because we're really trying to feature that hop oil that uh, the aroma that comes from the oil uh, and sooner you get it into the brew kettle the the better it is. Um, this is our day room, which is kept at about 45 degrees. Right behind us is our uh, longer storage room, which is below freezing. And so the majority of the hops are stored back there. And we have cold storage up in Yakima uh, and Oregon as well, uh, where we keep hops throughout the rest of the year. So the hops are kept frozen uh, until we ship them in refrigerated trucks to the breweries. So as you, this timing, so you go, you select the top hops and you talk about you need to have the brew ready. Can you describe that timing of when they're, when you guys select them and how they get here and how the, then how it gets to the brew? Yeah, so not quite as critical as our wet hop beers. Our wet hop beers, we actually pick, that so they go right from the field into a truck, a refrigerated truck, drives down to the brewery, um, and we start brewing of them. Uh, we're in communication with the truck driver and say he's gonna be here in three hours, we start uh, the brewing process. So wow. when the truck shows up, we can start throwing hops at it. So that can only be done in Chico, right? No, we do it here too. Refrigerated trucks okay. can come across here, okay. yep. Okay. Uh, when we first started doing it, we air, we shipped them by air. So we had a plane in Yakima, fly them down. Wow. But that was uh, pretty cost prohibitive <laughs> to do that. Uh, yeah, we were the, I think we were the first to brew uh, a fresh hop beer in America um, back well, many, many years ago. Um, one of our friends who was in the hop industry from England, he said he had had one in, in England years ago and we should try it just right in the kettle, right out of the field. So we, we did a, a couple batches and they were wonderful and we've been doing it ever since. Uh, but with celebration, we have a little bit more time, but only a couple of days. So uh, we will coordinate, we'll pick the hops uh, in the field, they'll pick them, put them right on a truck, uh, right out of the, uh, the baling process ship them to the breweries and then start brewing with them immediately. Wow. The timing is intense. Parts one and three of my interview with Ken are equally fascinating as we continued our discussion in Sierra Nevada's open fermentation, milling, and laboratory rooms. Now, if you found value in this video, please smash that like button. It really supports us in creating more content like this. And before you go, check out these videos on the screen. They've been carefully selected just for you, and they're filled with even more 
brewing insights and tips. Thank you and cheers.